for those of you who attended the virtual grand rounds last month, you know that the discussion there left a lot of questions unanswered. And the conversation is carrying on today with a variety of new perspectives from our panelists and with further questions from our audience. We will be touching upon the Annals of Surgery Guidelines, as well as the recently published COVID-19 Surgical Safety Checklist. Please note that you can ask your questions in the chat or on Zoom, as I said earlier, uh, or you can send them by email to COVID-19 at smiletrain.org. As I said, this session is being recorded. So please turn off your video if you do not wish to be recorded. And by keeping it on, you are giving us permission to share your video with the participants. I'm just pausing for a few more people to join in. Thank you. I am your moderator, Dr. Esther Nyambura Njoroge, the Vice President and Regional Director for Africa at Smile Train. And I am privileged to be joined by a group of panelists who are experts in their fields, some of whom authored the article on, in the Annals of Surgery. I will start with uh, our first panelist, Professor Peter Donko, who is a professor and honorary consultant, oral and maxillofacial surgeon at Kompoi Noche Teaching Hospital and Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He is first vice president, West Africa College of Surgeons, which means he is the incoming president in the next uh, college year. He's a president of the Ghana Clef Foundation and a director of the Kompuanoche Teaching Hospital Cleft and Craniofacial Clinic. We are also privileged for him to serve on the Smile Train Africa Medical Advisory Council. Professor Donko, please, please say hello. Hello. Hi, Peter Donko, privileged to be part of the panel. Our next panelist is Dr. Jolene Moore, who is a consultant and anesthesiologist in Aberdeen, Scotland, where she's also a senior clinical lecturer and coordinator for global health and human humanities at the University of Aberdeen. Dr. Jolene is a WFSA UK trustee, obstetric colleague for the WFSA and AAGBI's Safe Initiative and executive member of the UK World Anesthesia Society. She has worked with Mercy Ships and conducted training and education programs throughout Africa. Dr. Jolene, please say hello. Hello everyone, um, thanks for inviting me to speak at this webinar. It's a pleasure to be a part of this and I'd like to welcome everyone that is attending. Our third panelist, um, I'm, I'm hoping she's already joined us, is Dr. Nema Kaseje. She's a trained pediatric surgeon and public health specialist. She's a founding director of the Surgical Systems Research Group based in Kisumu, Kenya. She's actively involved in the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery and the Global Initiative for Emergency and Essential Surgical Care at World Health Organization. She's a surgeon with MSF and was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum in 2017. Is Dr. Nemo with us? 
Uh, yes, but um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I had a, a couple of technical issues, uh, but I'm here now. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, many thanks to the organizers and to the sponsors and to our moderator and to the co-panelists. Um, thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Next is Professor Adesoji, and I will not try and pronounce his second name. He is a professor of surgery at the University of Lagos and Lagos University Teaching Hospital in Nigeria. He's a director of the National Institute of Health Research Global Surgery Unit, Lagos Hub, and he serves as executive secretary for the Pan Africa Pediatric Surgery Association. Professor Hello, everyone. It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, we have Professor Godfrey Muguti, who occupies the professional, professorial chair in the Department of Surgery, College of Health Sciences, University of Zimbabwe, and is also clinical professor of surgery, Stanford University. He is a current president of the College of Surgeons of East, Central, and Southern Africa, COSEXA. Professor Muguti, if you're with us, please say hello. I think he hasn't joined yet. Um, we, on behalf of Smile Train, we would like to thank our co-hosts, that is COSEXA, Lifebox, the Pan-African Pediatric Surgery Association, West Africa College of Surgeons, WACS, and WFSA. So this call is structured in a way that we maximize answering of the questions. As I said earlier, a lot of questions were left unanswered. And we will start with a brief discussion between the panelists for about 30 minutes and then transition to questions that have been submitted through our email address. That is COVID-19 at smiletrain.org and questions that will be submitted through the chat. So feel free to send your questions through those two channels. Uh, first, I will briefly introduce the uh, situation. And we know uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, COVID-19 has affected different countries in uh, differently. And as of uh, today, more than 4 million cases had been reported worldwide. Uh, and across Africa, and uh, the figures I'm going to give are from uh, WHO, 70,000 cumulative cases have been reported and more than 2,000 deaths out of the 70,000 cases. Now, the surgical ecosystem in Sub-Saharan Africa is facing or will continue to face the challenge of maintaining essential and needed, very much needed surgery, surgical services, while conserving the resources that we have, protecting healthcare workers, and doing everything that we can do to prevent transmission of the virus, both to the health professionals and to the patients that we serve. While we have seen uh, COVID-19 spread across the rest of the world, the Americas, Europe, Africa's unique demographics increased disease burden and the fragile health system makes it difficult, actually makes it very complex for modeling and prediction of how COVID-19 will pan out in our context. Our governments have implemented a lot of measures to flatten the curve, to slow down the spread, and to minimize uh, casualties. So this evening, we are looking forward to hearing from our panel of experts who are involved either in the front line or are involved in supporting the health system in the to continue healthcare services, even as we are fighting COVID-19. And just as a reminder, send your questions to COVID-19 
that's one word at smiletrend.org or you put them in the chat. And I will briefly turn off my video to conserve my bandwidth. My first question is to everybody. I would like each of us to say a few words on, I think I've seen Professor Muguti join. I will give him a moment to introduce, to say hello. I had introduced him, I'll read his bio just real quickly, and then he will say hello. Professor Muguti occupies the professorial chair in the Department of Surgery, College of Health Sciences, University of Zimbabwe, and he's also clinical professor of surgery, Stanford University. He's the current president of the College of Surgeons of East, Central, and South Africa. Professor Muguti, please say hello. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to join the discussion this afternoon. Thank you, Professor Muguti. We are happy to have you. So to everybody, just briefly share your thoughts on the role of the surgical system in the COVID-19 response. Let's start with uh, Dr. Jolene. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, so the surgical system is really um, an absolutely key component of healthcare. Providers undoubtedly are going to play a significant role during this outbreak. And there will always be those procedures that simply cannot be postponed. We already know that a considerable volume of surgery within Sub-Saharan Africa relates to those uh, emergency procedures. And we also know that within Sub-Saharan Africa, access to surgery is an area which has seen considerable focus and with large progress made over recent years. The disruption to the health services that this outbreak could, um, could cause might mean that delays with seeking, reaching and receiving surgical care are exacerbated considerably. And those people that require surgery might find that they present in much more critical conditions. It's something that's been reported on here in the UK during this pandemic. And we've also seen it in other outbreaks with significant implications. For example, thinking about the rise in maternal mortality in some areas during the Ebola outbreak, and already seeing reports of this type of impact during this COVID-19 pandemic. As well as being responsible for managing the surgical patients, I see that there will be a role in ensuring that access to essential surgery continues through advocacy and through education within the health system and the community. Providers might also find that they have a much more extensive role within critical care, and that might be something that is new or not part of their usual work role. So far that we find that the COVID-19 pandemic has required providers to really adapt to rapidly changing information and rapidly developing roles, and that we've had to develop solutions. So leadership and teamwork being really, really essential. One thing that we've particularly faced in the UK during the early phases has been mixed messages from all different groups. So I think what I'd really like to say is that it's really important that surgical system providers come together at facility level, but also at national and regional levels to provide an organ coherent and coordinated response and ensure that any guidance um, that is created is feasible and context specific, given the huge variations in services, both across and within countries in sub-Saharan. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Desoji. Thank you very much. Um, just like Jolene said, the surgical system is a very important part of um, the response to COVID-19. As we know that surgeons are at the forefront of treatment for certain conditions, such as um, cancer and trauma. And if we just take one of that, we know that trauma is um, responsible for deaths that is higher than HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. And it also affects particularly the youth, usually between the ages of 15 and 30, which is usually the manpower, I mean, the age for manpower of any community. So um, inability, to be able to operate as a result of COVID-19 due to lockdown and the effects on um, other parts of the economy and even 
academics and schooling. But particularly because of those lockdown, there has been a backlog. And um, I'm part of so certain studies that has shown that that backlog could actually be millions in global um, figures. And in Africa, in some countries, it's hundreds of thousands. So definitely, uh, it's important that um, surgical services are being provided safely in the COVID-19 um, period. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Donko? Uh, yes, so thank you very much. Uh, I really, my colleagues have said it all. Uh, what is refreshing though is that definitely from experience of Ghana, a lot of uh, surgeons who normally do not work in the front line have actually uh, signed up with the national COVID-19 team and some have even gone to the field and participated in contact tracing. Others uh, have also been at the forefront of uh, testing, uh, et cetera. So, uh, and of course, those who need to attend to emergency cases are still doing that. Uh, but the, what has become very clear, however, is, is that uh, the, if there's an upshot in say surgical emergencies, then there's a, an incre increased competition for PPEs, which are needed in the management of, of COVID-19 cases. And, and uh, in our limited uh, supply chains, uh, that is in some cases has become an increasing problem. Uh, things are easing uh, and uh, and the surgical teams have been extremely helpful in training uh, other hospital personnel in uh, donning uh, PPEs. Uh, and so this team spirit uh, has been shown considerably. Uh, I think one of the uh, other things that has also become clear in, in the overall scheme of things is being the, uh, the uh, obvious nature of the weak borders we have. And you know, most countries like Ghana and others have focused on locking their borders, keeping everybody out, but it's the same people who live across on the other side, speak the same language. Uh, they were divided by colonialism. And so you don't really know when they come in. Uh, and so you see that, especially in West Africa, uh, it, it probably would have been much better if the countries in West Africa had even had a more coordinated approach to managing this COVID-19 uh, instead of say every country for themselves. And the poor testing regime in the various countries also uh, creates a false sense of, uh, you know, sense of, a, a, a false sense that we don't have that many. Uh, so th these are all things that, that I I for, for a surgeon, uh, you have to treat everybody as potentially infectious and, and, and be careful. So I think for that, I would just stop there uh, and leave others to also make some comments. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Donka. Dr. Nema? Apologies. Um, so I first would like to thank my co-panelists for their excellent uh, comments and uh, very comprehensive. Um, uh, what I just would like to say is, is that basically as a community, as a community of surgeons, anesthesia providers and nurses and everyone, we have a lot to contribute to the COVID-19 response. We have a lot to contribute in terms of technical expertise. Uh, who knows infection control better than the than the surgeons and the and the and the staff that works in the OR? Who is better at leadership? You know, when when you go into any hospital anywhere in the world, the people who usually fulfill the leadership role uh, um, and roles are usually surgeons. Um, who is better at critical care and monitoring the patient. So I think we as a community have 
a lot to contribute in this COVID-19 response. And we need to make sure that we are articulate and that we, we are engaging with the policymakers. And I, I really like the example from Professor Doncor. Um, I, I like the, the, the fact that uh, surgeons are, are venturing outside of the operating room and going to the field. We're doing similar activities in Western Kenya where we're working with youth and community health workers to screen every single household. So I believe as a community, we have critical technical expertise and, and uh, that we can contribute to the COVID-19 response. And what I would urge everyone is that we need to um, make sure that we are part of the conversation, uh, that we are part of the solution and that we are at the table. Um, uh, I, for one, uh, felt I just came back from Liberia uh, working with uh, MSF and of course, like in many places, we had to cancel elective cases and uh, my team in the OR felt a bit sidelined. Uh, so let's make sure that we remain uh, active and that we engage with the policymakers and we engage with everyone and we make sure that they know what critical technical expertise we have to offer in the COVID-19 response. And this is important because we all, this uh, pandemic is a threat to everyone. And so we all need to be involved uh, as a collective um, and make sure that we are part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nema. Professor Moguti, real briefly. Thank, thank you. We, we've seen how our governments have been trying hard to minimize the spread of, uh, you know, the infection in the community through lockdowns, quarantining new arrivals from other countries, um, and uh, trying to promote testing, you know, in the community. So within the surgical system, we can complement this by identifying patients who come seeking our services who are infected, testing them and ensuring that uh, their conducts are properly traced. We can also make uh, an effort to minimize the, the spread of the infection by ensuring that our health workers do not become the conduit through which uh, we spread infection into the community. And that we can do by providing them adequate personal protective, uh, protective equipment. And also, when we take patients to theater, we have to ensure that they are in COVID dedicated theaters so that they don't contaminate uh, other areas where non-COVID patients are being treated. And that our health personnel are properly donned with personal protective equipment and in this COVID era, we have to minimize the number of personnel who are physically in the theater and also limit the amount of equipment and other resources which could be sources of infection. And to ensure that after surgical procedures, proper measures are taken to clean and uh, as much as possible sterilize the environment. Um, we also have to ensure that, that during this COVID era, we deliver safe surgical services to the community. In other words, patients who come in as emergencies or relative agent cases like malignancies should be prioritized as they've always been prioritized in the non-COVID era. And lastly, those institutions that are involved in surgical training should find innovative ways of ensuring that the training continues during the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing those initial thoughts and giving insights on the role of the surgical ecosystem, spanning from going back to the front line all the way to providing leadership in this very critical time. Uh, Professor Moguti, I will come back to you. We have all watched the progression of the pandemic across the rest of the world. In your opinion and in COSEXA's perspective, what differences are there in how COVID-19 has unfolded and will continue to unfold in Sub-Saharan Africa? 
Uh, thank you. In your introductory remarks, you made uh, some comments about uh, the burden of the disease at this stage in Africa. But I would just like to mention that uh, the first case was diagnosed in China. We know on the 31st of, uh, of December 2019. And in Italy was diagnosed uh, the first case of a month later on the 31st of January. But for us in Africa, the first case was diagnosed on the 14th of February in Egypt. And I am in Zimbabwe, which is in you know, Southern Africa. And the first case in South Africa was the 5th of March in Zimbabwe, was on the 20th, 20th of March. So all this shows that the pandemic has appeared in Africa about six weeks after the first case in, in China. And we have observed that the rate of spread in Africa appears to have been slower than in Europe, Asia, and North America. One of the possible reasons for this could be low volumes of air traffic in Africa when compared to Europe, Asia, and North America. A number of African countries introduced the recommended measures, including long lockdowns, very early on in the pandemic. For example, in my own country, in Zimbabwe, when the lockdown was introduced, there were only eight cases and one death. Uh, currently, as you mentioned in your introduction, there are you know, around 66,000 you know, cases in Africa. In South Africa, there are 11,350 cases with 206 deaths. And in Zimbabwe, at present, we have 37 cases uh, confirmed out of 20,000 tests that have been carried out and only four deaths. It is possible that we are not carrying out enough tests in Africa, but it is also clear at this stage that we have not started seeing large numbers of very severe cases requiring intensive care unit facilities and ventilation, despite the fact that we are now three months into this pandemic in Africa. The World Health Organization predicts that there will be 190,000 deaths from COVID in Africa. It appears, therefore, that the West is still to come to us in the next few weeks. What is also important is the age demographic. Um, in South Africa, the average age is about 27 years, and this is representative for most of Africa, whereas in Italy, it is around 46 years, and this is representative for Europe. So with a relatively young population in Africa, one would expect that the overall mortality would be lower than in Europe and North America. However, we are aware from the media that in the USA and the United Kingdom, there has been a higher mortality among the black population. So fighting the, the pandemic will be more challenging in sub-Saharan Africa because of limitations in both manpower and material resources. Although most countries are coming up with homegrown solutions to address the challenges of providing adequate personal protective equipment for health workers on the front line, it remains difficult to meet the demand. As a result, it is likely that more health workers could be infected by COVID than we have seen in Europe, China, and North America. Other important innovations that have come in a number of African countries as a result of COVID include attempts in manufacturing ventilators locally. If we get the full-blown pandemic, we are likely to struggle with providing adequate facilities for clinical care, including intensive care unit facilities. In my own part of the world, which is Southern Africa, we're entering into the winter season, which um, stretches from May to August. And it is quite likely that in the next few weeks, we are now going to see a surge you know, in, the, in this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Muguti. That was quite comprehensive. And so, Professor Donko, I will ask you to add anything that Professor Muguti may have left out from the West Africa College of Surgeons perspective in Western Central Africa. 
and the second part of your question is in your capacity as uh, the Smile Train Africa Medical Advisory Council, what guidance are you sharing with surgical teams? So thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, I think uh, Professor Muguti has really addressed the issue quite broadly and comprehensively. Uh, uh, my only comment is that we have to exercise a, a bit of caution in celebrating uh, our apparent immunity from COVID-19. Uh, I think we still there's a lot of da uh, data which is lacking about, if you look at our health system in general, it's quite weak. One of the weakest points or aspects of our health system is lack of data. And information on COVID-19 is no exception. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in Ghana, for instance, we started off uh, picking the first few cases in March. And then we ramped up testing. Uh, and currently we've done over 160,000 and we've picked up 5,000 COVID-19. 19 cases, over 5,000 cases with 22 deaths. Now, every time we increase the, the number of people who are tested, we see the number of cases increase. Now, the, obviously, there's a lot of, this shows that there's, initially we were getting, most of the cases were coming from outside the country. And so the quarantine that took place was uh, considered adequate. But now we have majority of the cases being due to community trans uh, community transmission. Uh, if you look at the our social system and the living conditions in which we find ourselves and how difficult it is to keep our people really away from each other. In some homes, they live in uh, compound houses, sometimes eight or 10 to a room. So if someone gets uh, the COVID-19 and is not picked up early, several others do get infected. And uh, currently as I speak, there's a particular community in Ghana where in Ashanti region where almost all 80% of diagnosed cases in that region come from. Uh, so we, 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 we need to begin to look at uh, how our social systems can be adapted for the management of this, because the Western approaches may not necessarily work for us. Uh, having said that, even when we want to isolate our people, we need to be able to offer them the adequate support. And as surgeons, our voices are heard, and we have to be able to speak to authorities to make sure that the necessary social support is provided. Now, for, from where I sit as a, a leader in the West African College of Surgeons, uh, the impact in the longer term is going to be quite seriously felt. Uh, apart from the fact that there's going to be a backlog of untreated cases, uh, we have not been able to this year conduct our usual assessments where we produce surgeons to serve in uh, deprived communities. And, and as Professor Abuguti said, we need to look for innovative ways of training and evaluating surgeons so that uh, we may should be able to even evaluate them remotely. Uh, and if we have continuous evaluation, then perhaps there may be no need to, to congregate all of them at one point for uh, an examination as has been the tradition. Uh, because this is, this is an opportunity for us to think differently. Now, uh, with regard to a cleft surgery, a cleft, cleft treatment, the Smile Train Advisory uh, has deliberated closely and, and uh, carefully and thought that, well, uh, it, we cannot do anything different from what is going on in the various countries. We need to adhere to national guidelines uh, like personal hygiene, emphasize personal hygiene uh, in our practices, social distancing, the use of masks and coverings, uh, and avoidance of uh, non-essential movements and travel so that unless 
somebody needs to move, they really don't have to come and see us. Uh, and even when they come to see us, we have to space them out uh, uh, in our consulting areas. We go to maybe clean the surfaces where they come in contact with frequently. And the advice is also to postpone invasive treatments as much as possible, especially surgery and orthodontics uh, and face-to-face -face speech therapy uh, where there's a likelihood of aerosols being generated and, and transmitted between patient and practitioner. But non-invasive treatments are to continue, uh, which will include like reviews, patient reviews, uh, nutritional uh, therapy, psychosocial support, uh, for speech therapy, even though face-to-face -face, uh, uh, care is discouraged, telephone uh, consultations come and trainings can actually take place. Uh, and, and so, uh, and, and, and in keeping with, with the general guidelines on elective surgery, uh, we also should really hold back on elective surgery. Uh, and but make every effort to see uh, new patients who will, may need their psychological support because of the anxiety that the family face when they give birth to a deformed child. So uh, these are the kind of guidelines that we have put up, but these are being reviewed from time to time. We're monitoring each country's uh, situation and what is going on. Uh, and, and the surgical capacity and the COVID-19 uh, levels, uh, infection rates, uh, and, uh, and as much as possible, Smile Train and its partners are to make sure that they are sensitive to what is going on within the country and support national efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Donko. Uh, Dr. Nema, you highlighted a little bit about what you're doing in Western Kenya with community health workers. And uh, my question to you is, in your view, what does a robust COVID-19 response look like? And what does that mean for surgical care at the systems level? And also touch a little bit on how it's impacting, how COVID-19 is impacting community health workers and if there are new strategies that you are uh, putting in place, especially to protect the community health workers. Thank you uh, for that excellent question. Um, and so uh, in, in terms of what we've done on the ground, and I'd like to thank um, uh, Professor Muguti and also Professor Donko for really giving uh, great descriptions of what's going on on the ground. Um, and so uh, in terms of what we're doing in, in Western Kenya, we are basically leveraging assets uh, because when we discuss Sub-Saharan Africa, Often we focus on the challenges, we focus on, on what we don't have, we focus on, oh my goodness, we only have one, one vent for the whole country, or we only have 12 vents for, for the whole of uh, Western Kenya, which has a population of 7 million. And so we, we're shifting our focus to really look at, well, what assets do we have? Our number one asset, first of all, is, is the youth. So now because of the lockdown measures, a lot of well-educated youth are sitting at home uh, and not doing much and, and, and they're itching to get involved. The other asset that we have in many countries in Africa is the community health strategy and community-based healthcare, whereby every single household is visited uh, by a community health worker. And the community health worker basically connects each household to the health system. And so what we're doing is, is basically deploying community health workers and youth working together uh, using digital tools to screen every single household for symptoms. And in terms of 
uh, an approach that we should keep in mind. It needs to be integrated. Uh, and by that, I mean that we need to be connected to the community and, and generate that trust, generate the demand for, for services. And at the health system level, we need to make sure that the health system is prepared. So for example, we looked at oxygen capacity um, in, in one part of, of CIA, and we found that more than 90% of the facilities did not have oxygen and more than 95% uh, did not have pulse uh, oximeters. And so what we don't want is to generate that, um, that demand for services. And then when they do get to the health facility, uh, then the services are not adequate. So the approach we've chosen is an integrated approach with both community engagement and also health system strengthening at the health facility level to make sure that uh, we are training, uh, we're training health workers at the health facility level on how to care uh, for severe cases. And what we're seeing is that uh, a lot is changing and with this, the, uh, we're learning as we go about this, this disease. So for example, initially we thought that COVID-19 did not affect children, uh, but in the last week we were seeing more and more cases of children uh, present with multi-organ failure. And so although initially we felt protected in Africa because our population is young, we need to remain vigilant because it looks like COVID-19 is also affecting children and we cannot be, uh, we cannot sit back uh, and say that our population is young and therefore our population will not be affected by COVID-19. So we need to remain vigilant. We need to remain receptive to new evidence because we're learning as we go. And in terms of approach, we need to go with an integrated approach, uh, making sure that we're engaging with communities, uh, we're building trust, we're treating everyone with dignity. And at the health system level, we need to make sure that we're supporting the health workers. We need to make sure that they are protected with adequate PPE. And we need to make sure that they have basic training in critical care. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for speaking, uh, touching on children. And so my next question will follow on that to Professor Adesoji. You have written extensively about challenges that children face in accessing safe pediatric surgery in Nigeria. And from your organization's perspective, on the Africa perspective, how are children likely or being uniquely affected, impacted by COVID-19? And how will that impact their access to surgical services? Uh, thank you very much. Um, as we all know that, um, Healthcare workers in Africa are short, and for pediatric surgeons, which is uh, my tough, um, we know that in some countries there are only one or two pediatric surgeons, and on the average, it's about one to one million or one to two million um, population, um, and that has a, a very grave effect on the care of children, because what it means is that if a pediatric surgeon or the other health workers that are short anyway um, is exposed to COVID-19 and has to go on isolation, then probably a whole nation is at standstill. So that's very peculiar. Luckily, most of the reports that are out there shows that children do better with COVID-19 than older people, and especially compared to um, the aged. Um, so, if, if you look at it from that point, it may look like a positive thing, but the challenge we have in Africa is that many of these children are being catered for by guardians and parents. And so, if one of them is affected, then it impacts negatively on the child. And the, then the problem of the child becomes secondary to that of the caregiver. And I've also alluded to the fact that where in cases where you have health workers being ill and going on isolation, then it becomes difficult to keep up with treatment of everyone, including children. A colleague from South Africa just told me that in the, their children's hospital, 
that about 12 of the nurses had to go on isolation at the same time. Now, where, even though it may not have affected, um, even though the COVID-19 might not affect children, but because it's affecting those taking care of children, then that's a peculiarity. Um, with respect to what we are doing I am, as, as PAPSA, um, we have tried to encourage colleagues um, through emails and through messages because everyone that's in the front line, including surgeons, nurses, and other health workers, actually needs psychological support from colleagues. It's not very easy sometimes to lose patients, not to talk of losing colleagues due to this COVID-19 fact. So we consider that quite important as one of the things that we do. We ensure that we have regular communication with members of our association. In addition to that, um, one of the things that we have also done during this COVID-19, even though it predated the COVID-19, is online educational courses for our colleagues. So um, South Africa has um, an online course. Egypt also has. And they invite pediatric surgeons from all around Africa and outside of Africa. And people have been sharing experiences about care of children with COVID-19. And we have found that to be very, very helpful. Because um, at the moment, it's difficult to have hands-on training. Um, one of the recommendations from our study is that those who are not supposed to be in theater should be excluded from being in theater. So hands-on training has gone down, but um, online training has actually been on the increase. And almost every other day, you have clashes between um, one webinar or the other. The other thing that we have also tried to do um, as PAPSA to our colleagues is to recommend telemedicine consultations. So in places where it is possible for patients not to even come to the hospital. And um, in Lagos, for example, there is a, now a telemedicine facility. And in my hospital also, we yeah, try to use the WhatsApp to book appointments to advise patients so that it's only those who are urgent or emergent that are allowed to come to the hospital. And then even when they are coming, we insist that they must come with only one caregiver, either a parent or a guardian. Because in Africa, you know, we are very, very community oriented. And once they hear a child is ill, then the whole family wants to be there and, and show their loyalty to that family. But in this COVID-19, the experience has been that it's only one person that's allowed, and that's the policy, official policy of our hospital. So we have tried to do some of these things. Um, the other thing that has also proved helpful is that if we look at Africa, um, about 54 countries, and as varied as those 54 countries in terms of the World Health Human Development Index in terms of um, GDP, in terms of um, maternal mortality. So it's difficult to recommend a cap that will fit all. And what, what we have tried to do is that there have been guidelines from um, different bodies, um, different surgical bodies, the British Association of Pediatric Surgeons, the American College of Surgeons, the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery, for example, that have issued guidelines. And what we have encouraged people to do is that you need to adapt this to your local needs. Because what happens, what works in Ghana or Kenya may not work in Nigeria or Egypt. So we have also encouraged people to share these ideas as well. So as you adapt, they share it on our platform so that others can also learn from what you are doing. So these are some of the things that um, we have done so far and our children have been affected by COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you for that insight. Uh, we shift gear a little bit and look at the anesthesia aspect of surgery. Dr. Moore, 
as an anesthetist who is treating COVID-19 patients currently, and based on your experience with anesthesia in sub-Saharan Africa, what additional concerns do anesthesia providers have and what resources are available to guide best practice? And in your response, you could touch on task shifting and uh, because I've seen a question from the audience on task shifting in this COVID-19 era. Uh, thank you. I'm just gonna leave my video off for now to conserve bandwidth. Um, in response to the question, as anaesthesia providers, we're finding ourselves really at the forefront of treating COVID patients, both in the critical care settings, but also in the operating room. Uh, one of our primary roles is obviously airway management. So we're performing some of the highest risk procedures, and that's those which have already been mentioned that generate aerosols and therefore increase the risk of transmission. Uh, this risk could be confounded in areas where there are shortages of items and systems that reduce these risks. And I mean things like uh, not just PPE, but also viral filters, scavenging systems, negative pressure ventilation systems in operating rooms. All of these things can make a difference. So thereby the biggest concern for providers undoubtedly is going to be how to reduce exposure and limit risk of transmission. And a couple of the other speakers have already touched on the risks around this and the need to then isolate yourself. Uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic first began here in the UK, there was a huge coordinated effort to produce guidance and, uh, on how to help us to manage COVID-19 patients in a standardised way. But many of these were initially quite focused on critical care management. And of course, emergency cases didn't stop. Obstetric emergencies still presented, and we still had to take cases to the OR. As the critical care units began to fill up with the COVID cases, we also found that many of those patients also went on to require surgical procedures. And we found that we needed to really rapidly plan for managing COVID positive or suspected cases in the OR. So we find that focusing on really quite high tech strategies with significant deviations from our usual practice was provoking huge surgical team anxiety, um, both by increasing the volume of material and protocol to be memorized, but also just with a change to what is completely normal for us. Um, so we find that developing checklists was a really, really useful kind of memory tool. Uh, we know that the key to safe surgery is a coordinated team and a prime example of where checklists can help is the WHO surgical safety checklist. It's well known and it really uh, can act as a tool to improve safety. If we think about the prospect of managing a COVID positive patient for emergency surgery, it's hugely anxiety provoking and it's also very unfamiliar. We're not only having to plan how we manage the emergency case, but we're also having to think about ourselves, our team, and plans around infection control that is to a much greater extent than, than we have ever had to do before. The surgical patient checklist that has been mentioned has been developed by Lifebox in collaboration with Smile Train and the WFSA. And it's something I've been really excited to be involved in developing this tool. The checklist provides an aid to help work through the necessary steps to protect team members and standardize practice so that the surgical team follow a consistent plan, focusing on simple measures that can be taken. And it can also be adapted to local contexts. And there's been a lot of talk about that already. And that's something that I would absolutely encourage is that um, all tools and all guidance out there needs to be adapted to suit the local environment and the local context. The checklist is double-sided and the, the first page includes a series of prompts which focus on things like preparing the team, preparing for surgery, PPE, minimizing aerosolization, cleaning, disinfection, and waste management. And then the second page includes details on aerosol generating procedures and how surgeons and anesthesia providers can minimize aerosolization. It includes details regarding PPE and decontamination, and it also includes considerations and strategies for situations where supplies are limited and equipment and PPE reuse might be necessary. And that's something that has really been a worldwide problem and, and affected um, everybody. And we've all started to have to think about these strategies. It's been developed with input from providers across seven sub-Saharan African countries. And it went live this week. It's been really exciting to already be receiving feedback about it and um, seeing some images of the checklist displayed or being used. 
And I'd really like to thank everyone who's been involved in developing and sharing um, this tool. And I really hope that it will prove a useful tool to help providers to protect themselves and their team by minimizing exposure when operating on COVID positive or suspected patients. In terms of the, the question about task shifting, I, I think this, this is a huge um, area that uh, in the COVID pandemic, we've really had to think about how we do this. And it's a strategy that has been used in, in various countries uh, previously, particularly when we think about the shortages of anesthesia providers. There have been a lot of different strategies for task shifting as a focus to, to solve this problem for anesthesia, but also for surgery. And it's absolutely apparent during this pandemic um, that providers are having to step outside their usual role and they're having to do things that they've either not done before or not done for a long, a long period of time. And again, this is where things like simple checklist tools can be really, really useful to help prompt people in areas that are perhaps less familiar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jolene. And now we will take questions from the audience and now we will select a, some. We may not be able to answer all the questions because we have a lot of questions coming in. Keep them coming in. Those that will not be answered live, we will ensure that they're answered before we send out the recording. And the first question, and our panelists, any of you can answer. Uh, the first question is, health worker densities have have dramatically different health outcomes. Now with quite a number of health workers being infected with the coronavirus, what is the response plan to ensure having sufficient overall number of health workers in Sub-Saharan Africa? And I welcome any of the panelists to answer the question. Uh, this is Peter. I think this, this is a very big question. Uh, and Africa is, is unfortunately uh, made up of countries uh, who make it difficult for us to cross into each other. Uh, and so we, we don't even have a united front, uh, even though uh, we, are, we have more in common than we, we, than we have as been different for us. But uh, definitely we, we need to ramp up our human uh, resource development efforts and this is where it doesn't become just a surgical problem it becomes a national health issue uh, it's a matter of uh, just making ministries of health aware that we need to uh, increase the rate at which we produce human resource of all caterers and uh, and, and and make them uh, available and as versatile as possible. I think this is the only thing I'll say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dongo. It's a very weighted question that we possibly would not be able to sufficiently answer in I this sitting. But this yes, is so go ahead. Can I say something? Go ahead. Yeah, so I think one of the things that it's also very important is for policymakers, and sometimes it's difficult to address these issues. Um, because people want to be politically correct. But I think it's important to impress policymakers to make um, the necessary personal protective equipment available. Um, a study from Italy showed that most of the health workers that were exposed were actually exposed either as a result of non-availability or poor use of PPEs. So apart from the fact that those in the front line need to be trained on the use of PPEs, and like somebody said, when it comes to emergency, when it comes to a pandemic, there is no emergency. Every health worker must protect themselves. I gave you some statistics about the fact that health workers are short in Africa. For pediatric surgeon, it's one to one million people. So we, it's, it's just not um, thinkable to lose anybody. And I'm not saying that only for pediatric surgeon, for nurses, for other doctors, infectious disease specialists, even for the cleaners in the hospital. So there is need for training on how to use PPE, and then there must be provision of PPE. And there have been places where, with the appropriate use of PPEs, there has not been um, exposure of health workers to um, COVID-19. And I think this is 
perhaps the cheapest way to keep those that we have while we train others. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you for that addition. Maybe this is a wake up call we need for us. As somebody said earlier, surgeons are the leaders and need, well, the people in the surgical ecosystem are the leaders in the healthcare system. And that is the kind of leadership that is needed because it is uh, COVID-19 today, it's something else tomorrow. How do we address that? The next question from the audience, considering Nancy's symptomatic carriers, would it be appropriate to conduct routine COVID testing for surgical patients, or should this be limited to symptomatic suspects? Dr. Nema, maybe you could take that question. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I think I think we, as a global community, we are all uh, facing challenges in in terms of the availability of testing kits. Um, so even the most advanced economies are having trouble um, testing even the symptomatic uh, patients and and symptomatic citizens. Um, so I think much of what we will do unfortunately will be determined by the availability of testing kits um, for example out of the 6,000 households that we screened uh, about 70 uh, had household members with fever but we are still trying to get testing kits um, so although we would like to test them uh, we just don't have kits and so much will depend at least for the moment much will depend on the availability of, of testing kits. Ideally, um, it should be part of the pre-op workup just to make sure that, uh, that everyone, all the patients are screened and so then everyone can, uh, can, can prepare and, and everyone can be protected. Uh, but in reality, uh, with very limited resources, we'll probably go with, with testing those who are symptomatic and those who really, really need need the test. Thank you. The next question from the audience goes to mental health. Uh, we have seen across the world uh, mental health uh, issues in the frontline workers and what can what support can we offer the frontline health workers and what resources are needed for this professor mogote Dr. Jolene, maybe you can take the question. I'm not sure Professor Mbuguti is still able to speak. Um, yeah, no, no problem. Um, this is a, it's a really, really important topic and it's something there's been a, a huge amount of focus on here. And um, so definitely important to raise this. Um, to support frontline health workers, um, we first need to collectively recognise that these are really challenging times. Our mental health can be affected for many reasons and it is not unusual to be finding it difficult at this time. There's lots and lots of ups and downs. We found going from adrenaline highs mixed to deep lows for lots and lots of different reasons. Uh, there's anxiety due to uncertainty, the unknown, the constant changes to information about management, anxiety about how to protect ourselves and our family. There's the toll on well-being, a risk of burnout from additional workload, fatigue, as well as financial burden for a variety of reasons, concern over obtaining basic necessities at times. There's also a lot of talk about the risk of moral injury where healthcare workers are having to either act or witness things that go against their own values, whether this is moral, ethical, cultural or religious, simply because they just cannot provide the necessary care. And then there's the effects of social isolation and stigma. 
So thinking about what we need to do, um, I think first we really just need to acknowledge that all of us are at risk. Uh, we'll all be affected in some way. Uh, we will all have our own challenges around this. We also need to be able to recognize the signs in ourselves, but also in those around us and our colleagues. And we need to think about how we can support each other. Uh, we need to try to remove the stigma associated with infection and exposure, um, and also the stigma associated with mental health. And we can do that through education and through acceptance. By speaking freely about the topic, we are accepting that this is not a normal time. Uh, the, you know, things now are, are not normal and there is no weakness in admitting that things are difficult. Um, trying to maintain health, um, avoiding fatigue, ensuring that you get rest, sleep, meals, exercise and maintain some form of routine are all helpful but are sometimes easier said than done. There's lots of different um, resources out there available to help with well-being for frontline providers. Some of these can be found through the Lifebox and WFSA COVID-19 resource pages. Um, I think above all what we need to do is support each other. We need to work together rather than against each other. We know that a surgical team cannot function without its elements. We're all equally important and we're all in this together. So although we might have differing personal challenges and we might respond differently, we can all support each other in some way and just really always, always be kind. Always be kind. Very thoughtful. How, um, Professor Desoji, this question I will direct to you. Is there a any specific protocol for pediatric patients? And the second question related to that is, should we push for routine screening of cleft babies for COVID-19 before surgery in the future? And I'm guessing it's pediatric patients, not just cleft babies. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll start with the last one, which is, I think um, we need to assume every patient is a COVID-19 positive patient until otherwise proven. And therefore we need to be proactive in everything that we do. We must um, take the checklist very seriously, ensure that we are well protected. And um, even when we finish the surgery, we ensure that the doffing of the PPE is done in the operating room. The operating room is properly disinfected and decontaminated before the next surgery. I think that's the way to go because like we have heard from other colleagues, um, having the test kit available to test everyone is not realistic even in developed economies. And I'm not sure it will be available here in the recent future. So I think patients that deserve surgery should have their surgery but we must take like the days of um, HIV AIDS, you must you, um, apply your universal basic precautions, including PPEs for all patients, including units. Um, as to your first question, which is um, about, um, can you remind me the first question? I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there a Esther? specific protocol for pediatric for patients? Children. Yes. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I am not aware. It's possible there is because things are changing very fast. But at the moment, I'm not aware that there are specific dedicated protocols to children. However, most of the guidelines and protocol, including us, um, can be adapted to children all around the world. So there are guidelines as to what surgery should be done. For example, um, for children that have congenital anomalies that are life-threatening, that would be an emergent thing. And the, the proposed guideline all over the world is that emergencies must continue. So even for children, those emergencies must continue. For life-threatening, traumatic cases or surgical infections like perforated viscosis, those surgeries must continue. For urgent cases, for example, in pediatric age group, things like biliary atresia, things like um, that you just need to operate on cancers, 
those ones must be planned within the shortest possible time to operate. However, for electives, um, the general idea is that truly elective cases can wait. So a child with hypospadias that is able to void does not have any um, obstructive uropathy from it, can wait. Um, children with hydrocell that do not have any risk of um, probably obstruction as in hernias can wait. Even though we are saying that those ones can wait, they can wait forever. So it's also important that we begin to look at ways as the lockdown eases and as we begin to um, move over the cough, all right, and stabilize, we must begin to look actively at how we can ramp up electives. Because like I told you in a recent study that will be published very soon, it's found that even when you ramp up up to 20%, it may take close to a year to clear the backlog that has already been created now. So it's also important that policymakers make available operating hours and rooms to ramp up electives once the lockdown eases. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you on touching on those that those surgeries that can wait will not wait forever. And Professor Donko, this question is directed to you. What education and training can medical professionals give to caregivers during this time? You touched a little bit on education and uh, how you're managing patients at this time. What are the best ways to do so? Uh, well, uh... Uh, so at the moment, um, what is available, I mean, because of the fear of, <laughs> sorry to say, each other, uh, we, uh, <laughs> a lot of training happens at a distance. Uh, and, and so uh, for forums like this are extremely beneficial. And I'm aware, for example, that... Um, uh, through the agent, agency of Smile Train and West Africa College of Surgeons, uh, a series of uh, lectures on, on cleft lip and palate have been organized uh, for health workers. And I'm sure similar uh, topics, other topics can also be addressed in, in a similar way. I mean, it, uh, just to keep people engaged, uh, I'm also aware, for instance, that uh, in many of the very, very units, for instance, in my own hospital, uh, when we've not been able to meet face to face, we've been able to have seminars using Zoom and other uh, media, uh, mobility, mortality meetings, uh, even the use of PPEs and uh, information on COVID and its transmittability and those things. So I think. Uh, one of the beautiful things that has actually emerged out of COVID is, is our realization that quite a lot can be done even from a distance. The only challenge we must address going forward is the uh, poor nature of the technological infrastructure that we have generally in our continent. So I think these are things that should be prioritized by our various institutions and our various countries. Uh, so yes, uh, these are the comments I'd like to make on education. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Donko. You have touched on education for health workers who would possibly have access to such uh, resources like Zoom. And uh, well, for those who are in the audience, we do encourage continuous learning because from a question from the audience, from indications the COVID-19 pandemic is going to be with us for a long time, and this is sure to affect surgical training and medical services in general. So the question is, what lasting adaptations do you suggest for the sustainability of these activities in the face of the COVID-19 realities? Professor Donko has touched on the training aspects, and 
a little bit on the medical services. So I think that question is partly answered, but if one of the panelists has something to add, please do. Okay, so this is Soji Ademowa again from Lagos. I think one of the things that has come to the fore about training, particularly for um, medical training that is um, an apprentice model that need, and that needs close contact with patients is the fact that simulation is something that must be looked at in the long run. It's um, definitely there will still be patient doctor contact, but there may be a reduction. And one of the things that will need to fill that gap is simulation so that the, uh, the candidate or the student is able to acquire the skill. And by the time they come to patients, they are able to deploy that skill, just like it is done in um, laparoscopy or robotic surgery, where you need to have attained certain level of skills before you are exposed to the patient. So that may begin to have an increasing role in the future. And I think, again, um, just like Professor Donko said, um, platforms like this webinar have actually replaced the didactic lectures. So lectures are still going on and people are at home and they're learning. And then self-directed learning is another um, thing that is taking shape now. So I just feel I should add my word with respect to simulation, um, having a more prominent role in the training of surgeons of the future. Thank you, I finished. Oh, thank you, thank you. How is community tracing done in countries? Dr. Nema. Thank you for that uh, question. So we are basically, if, if if we take the example of, of Kenya, um, the, the government and the Minister of Health adopted the community health strategy in 2007. Um, so for 13 years now, the government has financed and supported uh, the community health strategy um, through community health workers. And what happens is that a community health worker visits every single household. So they will cover about 25 households and they would visit every single household to make sure that they, each household has access to basic health services, including immunization, including prenatal visits for pregnant women and so forth. And so what we're doing now is we're leveraging that system that's already in place, already supported, already financed by the government to respond to COVID-19. And we're also going to leverage it to, to build up the surgical system and to build up demand for surgical services. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, we need to begin focusing more on what we have and what, what is already in place and, and see how we can uh, leverage and deploy what's already in place to respond to different disease uh, conditions. So what we're doing now for COVID-19, following the pandemic, we will able to deploy the same thing for surgical diseases. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have PPE raw materials locally? There was a suggestion that PPE can be made locally and maybe it's time to start producing. And the question is, do we have PPE raw materials locally? Uh, this is Peter. Uh, what I can say is that uh, in, in, since the advent of COVID-19, uh, the four factories in Ghana have started producing PPEs locally. Now, where do they get their raw materials from? I have no idea. Uh, but, uh, but I'm sure that, you know, they've, they have a supply chain and they have a source somewhere, most likely not Ghana. Uh, uh, but 
that's something that I, I I'll find out now that you've asked that question. I never really actually thought about that, where the supplies came from, but they're producing large numbers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Donko. And I think just like the question on increasing healthcare workforce, so there's a comment in the chat that where there's a will, there's a way. And maybe it's time we started uh, considering all those. We have Dr. Nema talked about, I think it was Dr. Nema who talked about uh, ventilators being assembled locally. And so we have the wheel. We possibly have all the resources needed and we possibly could be able to produce this. Because as the conversation is going on, I, I think we are all hearing that PPEs will become, have become very crucial if you are to continue with surgical care. And in the absence of that, then we must be testing everybody. So it's time we, we the leaders, again, back to the leadership, we the leaders inform the decision makers on and guided them on how best to proceed. I will take a few more questions. Um, there is a question that PPE is not available in my country. Uh, what can we do for emergencies? Professor Desoji. Okay, so this is uh, Sergio um, I think that that's an ethical challenge. Because like we said, we, we do not want to expose our um, health workers unnecessarily. Um, to start with, I think some of these PPEs can be adapted. So in Nigeria as well, there, there's a lot of production of um, face masks. There is now massive production of face masks, apart from the cloth face masks, but um, even medical grade face masks. Um, in my unit, um, one of us ordered a PPE using um, impermeable material and got it to be able to operate. So I think this is a time to think outside the box. Um, every part of the world, God has provided what we need to survive. We only need to look inward. So in so those places where there is no PPE, it may be an opportunity to look inwards and look at what is available to adapt, but as a professional and also as somebody who is responsible for health workers being a secretary of um, PAPSA, I would not recommend you treating patients, particularly operating, for example, without being adequately treated. It is just like deliberate suicide. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but that, that's just the, the way I can put it. So we, we need to try as much as possible, make our governments responsible, provide what they can provide. If it's not available, we should adapt. If we cannot adapt, I'm sorry, I don't know what we can do. It will be, it's, it's a tough ethical decision to take. I don't know if other panelists will help me out. I think Dr. Nema wants to say something. I can see her trying to unmute herself. <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely, uh, Dr. Adesoji, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's an ethical issue. And as we said initially, we, we don't have enough surgeons. We don't have enough nurses. We can't afford to put our health workers in harm's way. Um, and, and so, and I think as a community, we need to be firm when interacting with politicians, when, when, when interacting um, with the Ministry of Health, Ministries of Health and so forth. We need to be firm. We need to say it, it, this is dangerous. We are actually already committed to serving others and we need to be protected as we serve, uh, as we serve communities. And so it, in my opinion, I agree with you, it's a red line that we should not be expected to cross. 
Thank you for your input. Uh, Dr. Jolene, maybe you could share a little bit about uh, WFSA resources on PPEs. And I, uh, just before you speak, we also have some resources on the Smile Train website on workarounds uh, gathered from different sources on PPEs. Dr. Jolene. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so the WFSA have uh, put together a list of resources. It's available on their website and there's, uh, there's two different pages. There's a list of general resources and then there's a list of resources that uh, really are focused for areas where there are shortages of uh, equipment or other resources. And there's a huge amount of information in there. And one of the things that we've been doing is gathering examples of PPE that people have, have been able to, to make or to source locally. And we've been providing that on the website. So there's a number of examples on there. And there's also links to some groups that are really doing a lot of work. Um, for example, N95 Decon are doing a lot of work around how to repurpose um, equipment to be able to clean masks and reuse them. So lots and lots of information. So please take a look. And if anybody has any other examples, then please do send them. We'd love to get them up. Thank you, Dr. Jolene. I believe all the organizations that are involved uh, on this call, Smile Train, Lifebox, WFSA, uh, I haven't been to the PAPSA website, uh, COSEXA works. We are all gathering resources to help our, our partners and the frontline health workers and our websites have a lot of information that can help out. There's a question about some governments are exploring indigenous medicinal plants in Africa, including their country, Ethiopia. What are the steps taken in the rest of Africa? I've also heard something from Madagascar. And I welcome any of the panelists to dive in. Uh, you know, there's a there's a big. This is Peter. Sorry, uh, there's, there's a very huge herbal remed, uh, herbal medicines market in Ghana, and recently, I think when samples of the Madagascar um, uh, product were brought into Ghana for for trial, the herbal medicine group uh, raised issues with the government as to why government has not asked them to, to try this. Um, but the government's response was that all these things will have to go through the FDA, which is the Food and Drugs Authority, for testing uh, and possibly be subjected to fit trials. Uh, you know, the, 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 the problem that we face with this condition is that even in the more, most sophisticated economies, uh, there's really no, no, no solution. So it's easy to have uh, individuals jump up and say, we found a cure, all that. And so uh, as, as scientists, we don't have to be skeptical, but we have to be cautious in, in accepting these things for use. They should be subjected to the usual empirical uh, assessments, uh, but but definitely we must encourage uh, local solutions. And if local helps uh, are the answer, that would be wonderful uh, because we have them in abundance. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Donko. I will ask one last question because unfortunately we are out of time. Um, in the face of shortage of manpower, especially in anesthesia, and you have to cover multiple suites as a consultant, do you don and doff after every case, or what are your guidelines? And maybe you could start with Dr. Jolene, who is already working in anesthesia, treating COVID positive patients, and then have a comment from each of the panelists. Um, yeah, I can uh, comment on this. So uh, it's, it's a really good question. And there's been a, a lot of talk about whether we can reuse equipment um, for multiple cases or across multiple sites. 
So it's, a, it's an interesting topic to be discussing. Um, I think it varies between exactly what PPE we're talking about. There are certainly some forms of PPE that we can wear. So masks, I think, are particularly in short supply across the world. And masks are something that we have started to use for multiple cases. As long as you're being very careful that you know, you're not taking it off, putting it back on repeatedly. So once it's on, you can keep it on and you can use it for what we call a session. So we now have sessional use of masks and that means that you can wear it for multiple cases. But other equipment, obviously gloves, which we would always change anyway, these are things that we would have to, to don and off between cases uh, because we also would need to know the status of the cases that we're seeing, who is positive and who is not, because as well as protecting ourselves, we don't want to be transferring any risk between our patients. Thank you. Dr. Nema, real briefly. I agree with um, with Jolene. So we we there are very limited resources, and of course we're going to try to maximize the resources that we have. There's growing evidence on on how to be sterilize N95 masks, and I have colleagues in New York that are reusing their masks. So it's a growing area. Um, as Prof uh, Donkor said, we need to remain uh, vigilant. We need to remain abreast of empiric evidence. Um, and, and at the same time, do the most good for the most number of people because we don't want to reuse uh, material and be vehicles of COVID-19. Thank you. Professor Desoji. Yeah, so um, I, I'm not a specialist or an authority on this. So I think I'll defer to my colleagues to what they have said. The only addition I would like to say is that there is now a growing interest in the reuse of N95 um, face mask. And for those who want to learn more about the reuse and decontamination, they can visit www dot n95 decon.com there are lots of resources there i attended the webinar uh, where you can either use hydrogen peroxide or ultraviolet rays or even heat to decontaminate and reuse it but i think it's an evolving and um, specialty of science and implementation implementation science we need to be careful so that um, we are very sure of um, what we are doing any time we need to reuse. But in the face of uh, lean resources, I think we just have to manage with, with whatever we have. And we may either use it for extended periods or decontaminate and reuse. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Donko? Uh, well, I think my colleagues, uh, my co-panelists have really uh, said everything that I could possibly say. Uh, yes, the only thing I'll say is that uh, you ha we have to be careful not to uh, make the, uh, the medicine worse than the disease. Uh, and, and so uh, we have to be careful uh, in all we do and definitely uh, make sure that in trying to find local solutions to shortages of PPEs. We don't make the, the COVID-19 worse than it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Muguti uh, dropped out of the call and he has been trying to rejoin unsuccessfully. And therefore, with those very few remarks, uh, we come to the end of this very exciting discussion. I like that on the chat there was a side discussion going on and a lot of information being shared. Thank you so much to our panelists for taking the time and to uh, our co-hosts, Lifebox, uh, WFSA, PAPSA, West Africa College of Surgeons, COSEXA, and to our main hosts, Smile Train. We are really grateful. 
and to all of you for taking one and 45 minutes of your time to join this discussion and to learn together. A standing ovation to all of you in the front lines and to all of you who are supporting the health system so that the frontliners can deal with COVID-19, we applaud you. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. The presentation will be shared together with all the links and the resources and answers to any of the questions that were not answered. Be blessed, stay safe. Thank you Thank for you. inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.